More than 70% of our planet is covered by the oceans. Our oceans are a home to a variety of fascinating organisms and according to the National Ocean Service, just 5% of Earth's oceans have been explored and charted. Especially the ocean below the surface remains unknown to humanity. The beauty of our oceans becomes obvious when diving underneath the surface. Eminently beautiful and ecologically very important organisms are the photosynthetic primary producers, such as seaweeds or macroalgae. The Swedish coasts harbour more than 350 different seaweed species and they play a key role in our valuable coastal ecosystems. Seaweeds provide space for marine microorganisms and animals, for example as a nursery ground for fishes and with their ecosystem services they maintain the overall biodiversity structure. They are havens for crustaceans like this hermit crab or for shrimps. Furthermore, you can find echinoderms like starfishes in the dense underwater forests. And sometimes also fascinating mollusks such as this nudibranch. Seaweeds are divided into three main groups. Red algae can have fine and delicate structures and are often characterized by their red color. Brown algae, to which also the group of the large kelps belong, can form and create extensive underwater forests and the dimensions of these underwater forests are sometimes even more obvious from high above. And then there are green algae. They have a unique emerald green color and when moving in the waves they look like salad leaves, which also imparts them their name, sea lettuce. Sea lettuces, scientifically known as the genius ulva, are a species-rich group and are very interesting as a future food in Europe. Like many of you, we as researchers are deeply worried about the human footprint in the prevailing global change. So we need to discover how to be sustainable for our and the planet's well-being. We will try to show you how science is helping to shape a greener future for all of us with the help of seaweeds. My name is Sophie Steinhagen. I'm a researcher at the Czerno Marine Laboratory of the University of Gothenburg. And together with my colleagues from the University of Gothenburg and Chalmers University of Technology, we investigate the Swedish sea lettuces and their potential of becoming a sustainable future food source. My research focuses on the assessment of the species diversity of sea lettuces in Scandinavia and on their large-scale cultivation potential. What we currently do not know and what I am investigating is how many different species of sea lettuce we have in Scandinavia. Just as in terrestrial crop plants, we can see that different species can have different characteristics and growth preferences or even higher protein contents. And this is vital from a food perspective. And those differences I aim to find out. Therefore, I am collecting sea lettuces from different locations and I investigate what environment they prefer to inhabit. Besides the collection of the algae, I am also taking water samples and make assessments of the environmental factors. I, for example, collect data on the salinity, temperature or nutrient levels. This enables me to identify the perfect conditions the algae need to be cultivated in. Back in the lab, I use different molecular techniques to identify the samples and assess their species identity. A suitable method to do so is for example called DNA barcoding. DNA barcoding works in the same way that a supermarket scanner uses the familiar black stripes to identify an item. However, the barcode used in DNA barcoding are gene regions which are unique to identify an organism to species level. With this research, 
I examine how many sea lettuce species we have in Scandinavia and how they can be distributed. After I have obtained this knowledge, I would want to find out how the different sea lettuce species differ in their cultivation and what species has the best characteristics to be used as a future food source. Therefore, we raise the sea lettuces from their seeds, the so-called gametes, and test how they grow under different cultivation scenarios. Just like in terrestrial crops, we start with the planting of seedlings and grow young little sea lettuces, and of course different sea lettuce species. When the seedlings are big enough, they are grown to full size. At the China Marine Laboratory, we have a seaweed greenhouse where we can test in tank systems what are the optimum growth conditions to generate large amounts of seaweed biomass. Here we can manipulate environmental factors like, for example, temperature, light intensity or nutrient addition and measure their effects, for example, on the protein level in the seaweeds and thus estimate the seaweed's value as a food source. Another way to cultivate large amounts of seaweeds is in the open ocean, in sea farms. I am, for example, testing how we can adapt the cultivation methods for sea lettuces to enable a sea-based cultivation in Scandinavia. We can, for example, show that the protein content of seaweeds cultivated in the ocean strongly varies with the season. For reaching the best protein contents, the seaweeds are cultivated in the sea farm throughout the Scandinavian winter when it is cold and frosty and their harvest is in the beginning of spring. With my research, I aim to provide knowledge on how to grow seaweeds as a renewable future resource and exploit these fascinating organisms in a sustainable and eco-friendly way. My name is Christopher Stenz and I'm a PhD student here at Scherner Marine Laboratory, which is part of the marine infrastructure at the University of Gothenburg. In my research, I'm interested in optimizing seaweed cultivations with the aim to increase their growth rate and protein content. One solution to mitigate the effects of climate change is to reduce the food consumption of animal-produced proteins and rely more on vegetarian protein sources. Apart from its direct impact on the climate, the downside with many traditional farm protein sources is that they take up large areas of arable land and often have a high freshwater demand. Seaweeds, on the other hand, can be farmed in the ocean and have high productivities compared to many of those land farm proteins. This makes them an ideal candidate to become a future sustainable protein source. However, the protein content of seaweeds is somewhat lower compared to animal protein sources and also one of the most popular landform proteins, the soybean. We hope to solve this issue by using two different strategies. The first one is to increase the protein levels during cultivation stage and the second is to concentrate the proteins using extracting methods. Here at Scherner Marine Laboratory we are focusing on the first issue. We are working on optimization the cultivation settings for seaweeds by cultivating them in different nutrient-rich media. In seafood processing, up to 50,000 liters of water can sometimes be used per ton of final products. These waters are often discharged as a cost to the companies, even though they are rich in nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus, the same nutrients that the seaweed needs to grow. We propose that cultivation of seaweeds in these processed waters can provide a chance to recycle these nutrients while also generating biomass with increased protein contents. By cultivating seaweeds in these waters, we move the cultivation setting up on land. This land-based cultivation allows for integration with process waters from industries and creates an opportunity to cultivate high-value species that have morphologies or sizes not suited for ocean-based cultivation. Furthermore, it allows us to control the production cycle and biomass composition of the seaweeds independent of the season, something that is harder when cultivated in the ocean. 
So far, we have cultivated four different seaweed species in different industrial process waters with promising results. For example, we have shown that seaweed protein content increases with up to four times in some of the process waters, compared to when they are cultivated in regular seawater. Our hope is that seaweed will become a simple and sustainable strategy to answer the increasing world demand for food rich in plant-based proteins. To reach this goal, our college at Chalmers University of Technology are working with the next step in this fascinating process chain. Hi, my name is Juan Trigo and I will tell you why we are so interested in sweet proteins at Chalmers University of Technology. As Christopher mentioned, we can follow two strategies to explore seaweed as the next source of food proteins. So the first one is by increasing the seaweed protein levels during the cultivation stages. And the second one is by concentrating the proteins using extraction methods. My research focuses on this second strategy. So its aim is to develop efficient and scalable methods to concentrate the proteins from seaweed. These proteins could then be used, for example, to produce protein drinks, protein bars, or veg vegetarian nuggets or burgers. And the method that I've been uh, focusing on is called the pitch shift method. And in our research group, we have been applying this method to different marine sources for the past 10 years. So to concentrate the proteins using this method, we start by mixing the seaweed with a specific seaweed to distilled water ratio. Then we use a high-speed homogenizer to partially break the seaweed rough structure. After this, the mixture is stirred for some time, which causes even more cell breakage to the osmotic shock. The pH is then adjusted to alkaline values, which will lead to more protein migrating from the seaweed to the water. Then we use a centrifugation step to separate the seaweed from the water rich in proteins. And then the pH of this water is adjusted to acidic values. At this point, most of the proteins will interact with each other and will precipitate. To facilitate the recovery of this precipitate, we do then a second centrifugation. And then product after drying uh, often has three to four times more protein than the initial seaweed. For example, for this species, the Ulva fenestrata, which has a protein content of around 20%, then product after the pitch shift method is close to 60%. Hope to see you all in the future to enjoy some delicious and healthy seaweeds.